gonna go over the science of squat depth and we're gonna start right now. So one of those endless debates always comes back to, should we squat full range of motion? Does that hurt our knees? Should our knees you know, track over our toes? Does it inhibit muscular strength or, or, or growing muscles? Does it impede on performance if we're doing full squats versus doing quarter squats? You know, quarter squat technique and quarter squat execution has been popularized by you know people like Joel Seedman, someone that I've trained like for over a week at one point for another YouTube video. What is the difference here? So if we have somebody who does squat, quarter squat, where they're going down to about you know 115 to 125 degrees, somewhere in that range, versus someone who's doing a full squat where their hamstrings and their thighs are just draped over their calves, which really is going to perform better? What's better for sports performance? What's better for application to general strength, to force production, to force development, to muscular impulse? And so fortunately, we have a full-blown study that has analyzed a quarter back squat and then compared that quarter back squat to a full depth front squat and a full depth back squat while having a control group that squats just to around 90 degrees. So Hartman, Wirth, and Schmidt Bleicher did an entire topic on influence of squatting depth on jumping performance. And so the way they set everything up was they decided they wanted to take athletes that were moderately trained and they would do different tests. And those tests were going to be quarter squat to around 120 degrees and we're gonna to try to work up to a maximum a single, and, and that's gonna be our pretest. We're gonna do a full range of motion front squat, you know, three days later. We're gonna do a full range of motion back squat three days later, and we're gonna test all these, and then we're gonna see where they start, where these athletes start. We're also going to test our counter movement jump, so doing a slight quarter squat and jump, and then compare that with a squat jump, so starting at 90 degrees and jumping vertically without having that eccentric load. And then also testing that with maximal voluntary contraction, so MVC. And the way they tested maximal voluntary contractions is by using a leg press and putting the leg press in an isometric position so you could just push into the pedal as hard as you possibly could. It would measure that isometric force and that would tell the researchers what the maximal voluntary contraction would be. And that was done at 120 degrees to see if there's some carryover from that quarter back squat strength gain. While they were doing the MVC test, they use maximal rate of force development. So somebody would push into this, that would be that maximal voluntary contraction, and then hold that for three to five seconds as hard as they possibly can, and that would help see how quickly and how long they could hold that muscular impulse. And then that led into that discussion of, okay, how can we actually take this information, quarter squat, back squat, front squat, transfer into counter movement jumps, squat jumps, into the maximal voluntary contractions and into MRFD and then find those results and then figure out how does this apply to sports. And so what they did is they had 23 women inside of this research project and 36 men. Now these were moderately trained individuals, okay? So they weren't rookies, but they also weren't super elite athletes. And again, they tested everybody up front with different pretests. So they would do the back squat with a full range of motion and a quarter range of motion. They would do front squats and then they did all the jump tests and then they did the isometric actions to see how well that they could contract and how well they could actually have force develop and then they went into a specific training block that was influenced by periodization basically developed by Andreas Schlumberger and Dietmar Schmidtbleicher. Okay, Schmidtbleicher actually was is one of the guys on this study as well. And so this style of periodization is sort of a, a similar style to undulating periodization and Schmidtbleicher has had a big influence on our parabolic periodization. And in this study, they spent eight weeks developing hypertrophy leading to developing the size of the contractile tissue. After those eight weeks of hypertrophy training, there was two weeks of a strength power phase to try and enhance the innervation of that larger contractile tissue. So it was a 10 week study, essentially with eight weeks of hypertrophy work and then two weeks of power development. And then we could start to see, you know, what ended up happening. Is there angular success from the quarter squats and how does that transfer over to the full range of motion squats and how does that transfer over to those other tests? And now one aside that I wanted to point out is that while you're reading through this, okay, I'm, you're reading through this information and you're like, okay, this, this is a pretty cool study. You start to see and you're going, all right, how, how did they, they find these results here? 
Okay, so when they were doing the quarter squat test, what they did is they actually had a, a Smith machine and the Smith machine sort of guides it, you know, vertically. But this Smith machine also moved horizontally. Now, the reason why they used the Smith machine was because they were concerned that they knew the quarter squat would have a much greater load, the weight would be a lot higher. And so they use that Smith machine for safety precautions, but they would still see some morphological adaptation from their training, right? And so one individual inside of this test actually maxed out the quarter squat test before the study even began. So you can see some of these athletes are, are well-trained. So he quarter squatted 380 kilos and did not fail based off of their determination. And it was sort of like, okay, if you're not hitting full depth or if you're not hitting the depth needed, if you're back rounded, if you're struggling forward with poor technique, they would cut that rep off. One individual who was part of the full back squat group did not get tested on the back end of that quarter squat because he had already maxed out the test the first time through. So that was the one individual that they, they sort of pulled out of, of the research in relation to the quarter squat because he already had all the strength that he needed from that quarter squat, which I just think is absolutely phenomenal. So now we can start to analyze those results of the study and see what actually happened. So getting into these results now, they were trained over 10 weeks, they were trained twice a week, and they even had verbal <laughs> encouragement from the, from the testers to try and push them a little bit more, and they would have forced reps, so one or two forced reps. So the study was actually pretty hard and they had a very high success rate as far as who executed the actual study. And so first we go front squat and back squat, full range of motion, front squat, full range of motion, back squat. Improved in the counter movement jump when compared to the control group and the quarter squat group. That's interesting, it's a quarter squat. When you do a counter movement and you go into a vertical jump, that's what they're testing. They wanna see how well you turn around the bottom, how much you know does your counter movement jump improve? And they saw there wasn't an, an, a direct angular transfer from that quarter squat because of the front squat full range, back squat full range was higher than the control and over the quarter squat. Then we get into front squat, compared to back squat, compared to control, compared to quarter squat in regards to the squat jump. So again, the squat jump, you're starting at 90 degrees. There's no eccentric. You start at 90 degrees and you just jump. The front squat group was the best group for the squat jump. And that was over the back squat and the quarter squat. Then we get into the deep front squat results. So they tested everybody in all the squat variations in the beginning, and then they tested them again at the end. So how did this impact the improvement of the front squat group? The deep front squat result, obviously it would be improved by, if you train the deep front squat and just the deep front squat during the study, your front squat increased. The back squat full range of motion also saw an increase in their front squat. The quarter squat and the control group did not see an increase at all. And in fact, the quarter squat group saw a decrease in the execution of their maximal deep front squat. Now we can get into the deep back squat. So the deep back squat group, they saw the highest increase in their deep back squat test post-test. Now, the front squat group that was training full range of motion, they also saw an increase in their deep back squat. The control group and the quarter squat group saw a massive decline in their full range of motion back squat. And so we've got to remember, okay, so they're not doing, when they're doing the quarter squat group, their weights went off the chart. They got really, really strong in that quarter squat range of motion. They got extremely strong there, but it did not transfer over to the back squat through that full range of motion. That We've gotta to try to remember this because we can think back to the periodization that they were using. We can think back to the actual maximal strength increase, but then what did that do for jumps? As we saw earlier, it didn't impact the counter movement jump and it didn't impact the squat jump and it did not transfer to the back squat or to the front squat. And that takes us into the next test. Remember, we talked about the maximal voluntary contractions and the way they tested this, they tested it unilaterally. So you're pushing into a leg press at 120 degrees. The test is almost identical in angle to what was being trained. Quarter squat to around 115, 120 degrees. The test is on a leg press, pushing in isometrically to see if there was an increase in maximal voluntary contractions and maximal rate of force development. When this occurred, the quarter squat group, this tells us if there was an angular transfer. A lot of people will say, oh, well, we gotta train in this specific angle based off of the sport. When it was trained in this manner, for 10 weeks, there was no transfer. And in fact, the maximal voluntary contraction from the quarter squat group 
actually declined substantially. Along with that, the MVC had no significant increase in any groups except for the front squat. The front squat had the highest values. They, they didn't really improve, but there wasn't a statistically significant drop-off like there was from the quarter back squat. So and then that takes us into the MRFD, so the maximal rate of force development. There was a decline across all groups over 10 weeks. So full range of motion, control group, and the quarter squat group saw a, a decline in maximal rate of force development when you train for 10 weeks doing twice a week squat training to essentially forced reps. So there was a decrease in maximal voluntary contraction. There was a decrease in maximal rate of force development for the quarter squat and all those. And then the three other groups saw a decline in maximal rate of force development, but they did not see a substantial decline in maximal voluntary contractions. It just did not increase. So that takes us into our discussion because the squat variations, essentially whatever squat variation that you trained, that's what you got really strong at. So if I was doing front squats during the 10 weeks, my front squat increased you know, substantially. If I was doing back squats, it increased substantially. If I was doing quarter back squats, it increased substantially. But the researchers expected that a couple things were gonna happen. They sort of expected here that there would be a minimal change in the vertical jump. There would be a minimal change in that dynamic strength. Some of the comments here inside the study are related to they might have lost motivation throughout the 10 weeks. It was a hard study, but also they weren't really training jumps. They were training focus on those squats and they wanted to see, is there an angular transfer from the strength gains of a quarter squat? And so that ended up taking us deeper into this. There's no angular transfer at all from training like this for 10 weeks. Does that mean that there's never gonna be angular transfer? No, that doesn't mean that. But in this 10 week study, the results show us that there was no angular transfer. And in fact, based off of how those squat variants transferred, the full range of motion front squat, the full range of motion back squat transferred to each other and they also increased the quarter squat, whereas the quarter squat didn't transfer back over to that full range of motion. And that leads us into the discussion of hypertrophy. Does hypertrophy work help with strength? And obviously based off of using eight weeks of hypertrophy training and then two weeks of power-based training, we can see, you know, based off of this, full range of motion movements increase hypertrophy much more so. And this has happened in other studies. We've seen this in other full range of motion studies relative to quarter squat studies. Full squat produces greater neuromuscular and functional adaptations and lower pain than partial squats after prolonged resistance training. So that's another study that has gone into this and actually researched the efficacy of quarter squats versus full range of motion. Now, if we can think about this a little bit more, because I'm looking at this now, MVC and MRFD, they probably take a lot longer than 10 weeks to improve. And also, if we take the data and we look at it like, all right, the, the squat variations, they had a direct impact on that similar variation. So full range of motion transferred really well to full range of motion. They weren't really doing jump training. They weren't doing jump training at all. So they could, in theory, take this test. Now we know the initial response with that strength training. Now what if we do contrast methods where we have the maximal full range of motion training and then we do that with jump training, what will we end up seeing? We think through application to sports performance. Hypertrophy training, as we see through the eight weeks, transfers really well to strength. Eight weeks of hypertrophy work drastically increased front squats and back squats. The quarter squat, it's not gonna increase your hypertrophy. The size of the actual contractile muscle did not increase. And so the innervations aren't gonna be as substantial as in the full range of motion. So when we have a muscle that gets bigger and then we train it to fire more effectively, now we have a stronger muscular impulse, okay? So that can lead to, uh, in theory, greater rate of force development. Clearly it can't happen in 10 weeks and we should be training that specifically. And I think that when we're talking about this as well in regards to sports performance, perhaps because we're doing a, a quarter squat test, it's a little bit slower, it's really, really heavy. If we can compare that, let's take this a little bit further. What if we do something like what we call a linebacker jerk, where you're starting in a quarter squat? This is what I would really like to see. Does a quarter squat starting position in a linebacker jerk, in the behind the neck jerk, along with full range of motion movement, does that transfer to a vertical jump or to a squat jump. So now you're doing some max strength work and we have the information of what the max strength does. Doesn't increase vertical jump, it doesn't increase squat jump. 
but if we put in one group that does a behind the neck jerk with a dip, and then we have another group that's doing a linebacker jerk without the dip, if we do this for 10 weeks, we know what happens with the strength movement. Now what happens with the squat jump and with the vertical jump with the counter movement? And I'm interested to see what that would result in. I think that ultimately what we can take away from this is that one, transfer of training is extremely important for sports performance. If you're doing full range of motion lifting, you can increase your maximal strength very, very well and it transfers to other movements, which in turn will likely transfer to the field. If you're an offensive lineman and you have to get into deeper positions and you're mobile enough you know, to get lower with your hips, doing full range of motion back squats and full range of motion front squats will probably carry over really, really well. Now that angular transfer of like the athlete stance doesn't really transfer as well, especially if you're not doing any jump based training. So how can you guys take this information and then continue to apply this? And I think that that's one thing that we did inside the Sports Performance Bible. You can pick this up at garagestrength.com. And we've got an 18 video course along with this actual book where we go into this stuff even a little bit more further, a little bit deeper. If you take this information, right, you need to do work that is gonna be absolute strength based. You need to do full range of motion work. You need to do full range of motion front squats and back squats. But because there was no increase in the vertical jump or the counter movement jump and the squat jump and there was no increase in the MVC or the MRFD, now we know that there's a transfer of max strength here. We know that the quarter squats didn't really transfer to anything. They were sort of worthless. It, it, it basically it didn't do anything. Like you might not need to do them. And I think that that's one thing to bring up when we're thinking about someone like Joel Seidman. Are those quarter squats that he's doing effective for performance? Not really. They're not really effective for performance. Now, to be fair to Seidman, he might be doing other things like jump training that make it okay. So that's where I believe everybody should be taking this is that you train maximally, but you still should be doing full range of motion technical coordination movements. So that means full range of motion snatch, full range of motion cleans, jerks of, of whatever nature, variations of jerks. Then you can also do variations of cleans and snatches. So power cleans, power snatches. You keep developing that maximal strength and then you bring in some more plyometric work. That plyometric work is likely going to transfer really well. So if we see an increase in max strength, we are likely over the span of 12 to 16 weeks going to see an increase in power output and the ability to absorb force because we're also doing technical coordination work and we're doing plyometric work and we're doing some type of speed work. So take this study, I would say base level, quarter squats, pretty much worthless based off of max strength, but understand transfer of training. And again, that's what we go into deep inside of the Sports Performance Bible. And even if you guys need help with your squat-based program and you wanna learn how to get stronger through a full range of motion, click on the link down below, head over to garagetrank.com and you can pick up our squat training program to blow up your squat so you can get stronger and more explosive and become a better athlete. Until next time, make sure that you always cultivate your power. Peace.